family, welcome again to our in our time of 24 hours of prayer and fasting, financial fasting. It's been uh, a privilege to be able to to pray um, and to be able to seek God uh, together with so many of his brothers, my brothers and sisters, his sons and daughters. And, um, and so we're going to look to the Lord even in this moment. Father, we thank you for uh, what you've done, God. We thank you for your presence. Uh, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to seek your face. Uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for everything that you're doing. We thank you for every way that you've made. God, we thank you for giving us a new revelation and new sight, new insight. God, a fresh wind uh, to wrap ourselves in you and your presence and your love to know that you're with us. You are our God. We love you. We glorify your name. Pray, Father, that we hear uniquely from you and that we will do the things that you call for us to do. Be the people you call for us to be. Exalt your name above all. In the name of Jesus, amen. During this time of 21 days of prayer and financial fasting, we as a family um, were encouraged to spend time with uh, a 21 day devotional from uh, Pastor George Thompson. And it's been, uh, it has been a blessing to be able to, to really glean in um, and listen into what it is that God is really pushing us and, and showing us about who we are. And I get the opportunity to really just uh, share from one of the days of the devotional and this day is uh, was actually titled "Humble Yourself." Humble yourself. Humble yourself. There was uh, a scripture in Proverbs, in 20, Proverbs twenty nine and twenty three, uh, that says, uh, "Pride belongs to a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor." Uh, you know. We don't necessarily think about pride when it comes to our finances. Sometimes when we think about our, our financial situations, we don't always uh, position ourselves or think of ourselves as uh, being humble um, unless it's in a position of we don't have it. <laughs> You know, when we when we don't have something, when we we have something that we desire, or we have fallen flat on our behind um, because we made a mistake, uh, because we didn't do things that we were supposed to do, we then become humbled, right? We use that term humble in that in that regard. Uh, we were humbled. We 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 had it all. We lost it all. We were humbled. We uh, made a bad financial decision. We we got humbled in that decision. Uh, we we really uh, uh, we really didn't didn't actually get everything we were, we wanted to get. We didn't do the things that we wanted to do. They, our plan that we tried to enact it we made us fall flat on our face. So we were humbled. I think it's interesting that this is uh, titled "Humble Yourself." Because if you think about what it is to actually humble yourself, is to really set yourself lower, never to think of yourself as higher than you are, to humble yourself, to uh, be willing to, to submit yourself to a higher authority, to think of yourself as uh, in a lower position, even if you, you have it all together, even if you have all the 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 prestige the authority uh even if you are the one who is the ceo of the company you can still be in a position of humility and when you don't have it when financially you can't seem to rub two nickels together you can still be humble well, you, for some people, you say, well, it's easier to be humble when you don't have it, right? When you have it all, this might be a little bit harder to be humble. But here's the thing. 
money is a tool. And a lot of times we, if we, if we consider the way that the world, worldly systems have been set up for, for thousands of years, thousands of years, there has been a premium on a particular product. Um, before money was known as a currency as we know it, as coins and as dollars, as paper folding, or, or even as in credit, in, in credit cards and statements, even thousands of years, the currency, what, what people use to trade one thing over another, there was some type of a value placed on a commodity over a, 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 over a thing. Even thousands of years, it might have been gold and silver. The, the, the conquest um, from the Europeans to go to the New World was in search of gold. The city, city of gold, or uh, uh, the Incas, or the the Aztecs and the Maya. But even if you go before that, the premium of gold is what we, it, it it would cost. The premium of silver of what it would take. We even know Judas. Judas uh, betrayed Jesus for thirty pieces of silver to know that there that there is. Something that exists, gold and silver are commodities. They exist inside of the earth. And at some point or another in the history of mankind, when mankind began to dig or they opened up uh, 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 caves or, or some type of thing happened, when they saw gold and when they saw silver, there was some type of a premium that was placed on these things. And that became the currency. The person uh, who had more of it became the one who had the authority figure, the one that was able to call more shots because they had more money, the one that was able to, to uh, uh, make their way in life into a, a greater financial position was because they had more of what other people saw as valuable. Money is a tool, though. Money is a tool is used as a tool to make a transaction for one thing to another. It is also a way to set up the wealth to somebody else, but it's also a tool to be able to help somebody else that might be in need. Money is a tool. And in our, in our financial fast, I know we've been stretched because what we've been used to doing is using money as a way to get us what we want so that we feel good. Give us, get us what we want so that we uh, uh, are not able, so that we don't have to be concerned about a thing, right? We use money as a way of self-soothing. I use my money to buy the ice cream and the cookies and the, and the chips that I want because I, I, that's how I'm emotionally I'm dealing with this thing. I use my money to go out and uh buy things on Amazon because when I'm stressed out I like to shop and I like to buy things and I like to go or I use my money to go online and buy things online uh because I, when I'm when I'm really going through a time I really like to go out and try to get the best bargain the best deal because it shows that I'm really financially savvy and I'm really smart and then how I spend my money well money is a tool Money is a tool. And some of us have been stretched to not go out and impulsively use our money in a certain way. Well, the, the reason why it's humble yourself, it really sticks out, is because when we, when we start to purpose money for something that it wasn't intended for, when we start to consider what money is used for, and is in the way that we have positioned money as a worldly standard, Using money as a way to, uh, to climb a ladder, uh, as a way of prestige, as a way of, of gaining authority, a way of, of gaining a, a, a larger platform. That's how we, many of us, have been using money, but money is a tool. Money is for a purpose. I, Pastor George wrote this, and I think is, is well, really well written. Re, uh, well written. Um, money is for a purpose, not a scorecard of our greatness. Mm. 
if we think about what it means when we have more money than somebody else, um, we can see it politically. That's what we do. We hype up politically who, who is the candidate that raises the most money. It's a scorecard. We have more money than them. This is what happens when we look at uh, schools, uh, universities, and colleges. Certain colleges can say, well, our endowment is this because of the, how much money we have given. It's a scorecard. It's a, but instead, what if we realize that the money that is being used the money that's being raised, the money that's being given, the money that's even being earned through a job is for a purpose. The money that we have, the financial position that we may have, the status that we may have might be higher than somebody else's. And there are many people that are financially in a different status than we are. Money is never to look down, as, as Pastor George wrote, look down upon others' lower financial status and view their status as a character flaw. Pride, if we're not careful, will make us think that we're not, we're something that we aren't. Pride will make us think that we are something that we aren't. Pride in what we think, oh, we are the, we're the most financially savvy person. So on the stock market, look at what I've done with my stocks. Uh, because I did this one position and, and I, was, I came into some money. So because I came into this money, it's given me more position and more clout. And there are many people who may not have what you have. We should never look down on anybody else's financial status. But this is a big thing that the Lord has for me, to, to, and, and, and it's so true. I wrote this down. Pride can happen at any financial level, though. We can think about pride happening when you got it. Oh, those people, man, those people need to be humble. They got so much money. They don't know what it's like for all of us. They don't have it. We can look at insert, insert whatever tech guru or CEO or, or even political candidate or a politician, the person that has all of this money, they need to exhibit some more humility. But do you realize pride can happen at any financial level? This is where God was really showing me because I was reminded of the places where pride was lurking in my own life. For many years, after I graduated from college, even while I was in college, I worked part-time jobs. And I was in school and going to, going to work, and I've had a variety of jobs over, over the years. And there were times in which I tried to get jobs that I wanted to have, uh, uh, wanted to apply for positions, just couldn't get them. So instead of um, what I did was actually I worked more than one job. I started to work multiple part-time jobs just so that I can make sure I made rent. And it was a humbling position to be in, to have a, a degree and, uh, and wanting to do something with my degree, trying to attain a certain educational status, trying to, when I had aspirations of going to, uh, uh, going to med school and I was uh, doing my doing what I could to go into that and trying to study for the MCAT, trying, trying to take classes and trying to work and trying to do things at school, uh, trying to do things at church. I mean, I was I was busy trying to do a lot of things. And so what I would do is I would actually piece together part time jobs just so that I can make a living. And I remember around the time that that my wife and I actually started to uh, to. To, to engage in, in conversation and we're getting to know each other a lot more. Um, I remember 
uh, being able to actually get another job. I remember I got the second job, and I was so happy to get this second job. Uh, I started tutoring um, on the side. I, was, I, had a, I had a primary part-time job that would only work with God me have so many hours, and I started tutoring on the side, and I really enjoyed it. And God was even moving me because that was something that I knew the Lord was in because I was starting to move towards uh, 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 teaching that I become a teacher later on in life. But, but as I was tutoring and I was spending time um, doing that, I was, I was making some money, and I started to take on different jobs after when tutoring ended. Uh, I started to take on other jobs, other part-time jobs. And, and this was a trend for a while until I was finally able to get a full-time job. In 2012, I remember I got this full-time job, full, full benefits. I, was a, a, I, was, I had some management. Uh, uh, it was an opportunity to do things in management. I was so grateful. And I remember being able to save up, and I was wanting to save up money, save up money so that I could spend time and, 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 and get my wife an engagement ring because I wanted to marry her, my girlfriend at the time. Well, we got married seven months after we got engaged, and I'd only been on my, part, my full-time job. I'd only been on the job for a little over a year maybe around a year and a half when I uh, asked my wife to marry me. I didn't have a lot of money. And when we, got to, when we got to the wedding day, I had to get a whole new job because I was moving. And I remember being in that position where I wanted to work a particular job and I wanted to do something that I wanted to do and I wanted to command the amount of money that I wanted to command and I wanted to do things with the money that I had and it was all about me. It was a lot of I statements. I didn't have a lot of money. I I was in student loan debt well beyond any capacity that I could ever do it. I wanted things to be done on my way and on my watch. And I remember after we got married, when I still didn't have, I still wasn't making a lot of money, that my wife and I, we, we went through some financial, uh, we went through financial peace with Dave, Dave Ramsey, and, and my wife presented me with the opportunity for us to combine our bank accounts. And I said, oh, wait a minute, no, 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 no. But the thing about this is that my pride was keeping me from the blessing that God had already had for me. It was my pride that was causing me to stumble. When there were times in which I really could have had other opportunities to work, when I had other opportunities to take different positions or, or I could have been doing something different, doing the things that was, that was the most meaningful to the calling that God had on my life, pride was the thing and the opposition that was keeping me from it. James wrote in in James 4 and 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is the thing. Because I didn't humble myself, I was still kept low. And it wasn't until I humbled myself that God was the one who lifted me up. Many of you know that feeling when you are trying to be the one to lift your own self up. And if you're the one trying to lift your own self up with your own financial aspirations and your own financial goals and your own things that you want to do with your money, if you don't have the position to humble yourself to realize that it's not your money, that it's God's, If you don't have the position to know that no matter whatever state you're in, just like Paul said, Paul even Paul wrote about this in in the book of Philippians. And I think it's it is a wonderful piece of which being able to understand what it is that we what position we really need to be in position. uh, uh, Philippians four and, and 11 says this. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all of the all things. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. I know it in the King James, right? I, I can do. We, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, who strengthens me. We use that. That last verse, that verse 13, Philippians 4.13, we use that, that a lot. We use it a lot to try to gain a certain a, a, a position. But Paul, in context, was using this to say, I know what it means to humble myself. No matter what my situation is, I will be humble. I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it's like to be in want. I know what it's like to have plenty, and I know what it's like to be in want. But no matter the situation, I will be content. Humble yourself. If you got it, great. Be humble. If you don't got it, it's okay. Be humble. Pride can exist no matter where your financial level is. So don't think that pride isn't something that will be lingering around. It's not lingering around you because you don't think you're at that financial level that you want to be at. Pride may be the thing that's keeping you at the level instead of being at the level that you want to be at. Also, don't think that you're, you, you, because you got it that there's nothing else for you to do. No, be humble. Stay humble. Know that the money doesn't belong to you it belongs to God. Why? Because the paper in which the bills were printed, God made that. And the coins and, and the copper and the, and the zinc in which the coins were made, God made that. And the gold ducats in, in, that's in, inside of Fort Knox, God made that. Matter of fact, he made the metal and he made the gold and he made the screws and he made the wood and he made everything else that goes into the, the reservoirs and the, and the, and the, and the repositories. God made it all. It belongs to him. So humble ourselves before God. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, you said that you are opposed to the proud, but did you also give grace to the humble? Pray, Father, that, Lord, we will seek your face and humble ourselves before you. Humble ourselves before you so that, Lord God, we will hear clearly from you. Humble ourselves before you, God, so that we will know exactly that it was you, Lord, that did it. Humble ourselves before you so that you will lift us up. You will be the lifter of our heads. Our money belongs to you. Not just in word, but in fact, in, in, in principle. Let us walk with this principle, with this chief idea and this chief truth that you, God, own it all. You own the cattle of a thousand hills. The gold and the silver are yours. So we humble ourselves before you. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have walked in a haughty and prideful spirit where we thought of ourselves as more than we should have. Or, God, where we thought of ourselves in anything that is in contradiction to you, who you are, where we thought of ourselves as our own God, where we thought that we will pull ourselves on by, up by our own bootstraps, where we thought that we will have to work harder in order to gain more, where we thought we had to do better. God, you are the one who gives the best. There is nothing better than you. And so you gave your best every time you gave to us. So the money in our bank account belongs to you. The tithes and the offering, they belong to you. The gold and the silver belong to you. Our credit cards belong to you. 
Help us, Father, in revealing us the places where we've been prideful, Lord. Every hidden place, Lord God, where, where pride has been lingering around, Lord God, where we've been wondering why, God, you haven't come through in our bills and our finances. Father, reveal those places in us as we submit them to you and submit ourselves under your authority as we humble ourselves before you, that you are the righteous judge, that you are Lord over money. You are Lord over our finances. You are Lord over our bodies. You are Lord over all. You are Lord of all. And as we humble ourselves before you, you lift us up. Where we've been financially frustrated, God, we submit ourselves to you and humble ourselves to you, that you lift us up, that we hear from you. We hear from you. You lift us up to the places that you have us to go. We put our money in the places where you tell us to put it. We tithe as you tell us to tithe. We give as you tell us to give in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We glorify your name and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hi, friends. I pray that you are being blessed in our 24 hours of prayer time. And I hope that these 21 days of prayer have been extremely beneficial and such a blessing for you. Uh, in this next teaching segment, I actually want to go back to where we left off in Luke 18 and verse number one, because there's still so much more in this passage about the importance of prayer. I want to read it to you again. I hope you grab your Bible and you're ready to dive in. It says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That's the really key important point. He said, A certain town, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what this unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you that he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Man, this passage is full of important biblical truths about the power of prayer. And that's really what I want to talk about in this second teaching segment. I want to talk about the power of prayer. The significance and the power of prayer is clear from the very first line in Luke 18. It says that Jesus shared this parable to teach the disciples and us that we should always pray and not give up. And so Jesus is teaching then that if we pray, and pray about everything, then we won't give up. But the converse is also true. The other side of this point is pretty evident. Without prayer, there will be plenty of moments in difficulties and challenges that you will feel like giving up. So what is a parable? Because Jesus would often teach in parables. A parable is a fictitious story with a deeper spiritual meaning and message. And so this parable is really important and nuanced. It revolves around three people, and I want to break it down for you. Number one, there is this judge. The judge in this parable represents God, his power, and his authority. The judge is the authority for this town, just like God is the only real authority for our lives. Then there is the adversary. The adversary in this parable is a picture of the enemy. In fact, that's what the word Satan means. It means adversary. So just like this widow had an adversary, well, guess what? We have an adversary as well. And then there is this woman, the widow, in this parable. She represents the believer and the church. And Jesus calls her a widow for a reason, because she's got no one to help her but the judge. And likewise, in our lives, our only real help and hope is God. So what does this widow do? This widow, notice, brings her complaint and issue to the judge first. That's important. We talked about that in our last teaching segment, that prayer should be our first response, not our last result, not our last resort. And so the whole point that Jesus is making is that prayer is how this widow prevails. And just like her, prayer is how we will prevail regardless of the situation. So I'm going to give you a couple of points as we dig into this passage. Number one, prayer is what God desires and responds to. So in order to understand the power of prayer, you have to go all the way back to the beginning, to the very first mention of prayer in the Bible. It's in Genesis 4 and verse 25. It says, Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to call, there it is, on the name of the Lord. So think about this. Up until this point, people had only known God as a creator. He made the world, the Garden of Eden, and everything else. But then, at this moment in Genesis 4, people began to pray. They began, the Bible said, to call on the name of the Lord. I want you to see this, that before there was a Bible, before the first preacher was ordained, before the first choir was formed, people began to pray. They began to call on the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, 
the very first name for the people of God. Guess what? It's not Jews. It's not even a nation of uh, Israel or Hebrews. In the very beginning, the original name for the people of God were simply those who called on the name of the Lord. That's where we see prayer taking off. But it also gives us an insight into the power of prayer. Prayer is communication with God. And the reason why God responds when we pray is because we were created to be in communion with Him. Prior to original sin coming into the world, that's the kind of connection that Adam and Eve had with God. They would talk with Him daily without any restrictions. They had unfettered access to God and they would communicate to Him. And that is what prayer allows us to do. Another reason why God responds when we pray is because prayer communicates that we are dependent on God. You know, anything that you don't pray about, you are essentially saying to God, I don't need your help with this. This is what the Bible means when it uses the phrase in Genesis 4 that they called on the name of the Lord. And you see this phrase all throughout Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament. It says they called on the name of the Lord. They called on the name of the Lord. And so and so called on the name of the Lord. And what that means is it means to cry out. It means to implore aid. That's what real prayer is. That's the kind of prayer that touches the heart of God. You know, a great theologian once said that the best style of prayer is that which cannot be called anything else but a cry. That's what God invites us to do all through the Bible. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. God is saying, cry out to me, call to me. The other reason that this is important is because this means that God is not aloof. He's not disconnected. God is not up in heaven twindling his thumbs. He, he, he said from the very beginning, I will help you if you call on me. When you don't know what to do, call on me. When you don't know which way to turn, call on me. When you're ready to throw in the towel, call on me. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, in verse 7, Moses said this. Moses said, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him. Oh, that's so powerful. I love it. Moses is saying the other nations may have better weapons, they may have better chariots, but they don't have what we have. We know that when we call on the Lord, He's going to respond and help. And you know what? Satan's main strategy from the very beginning, when he slithered in, and tripped up Adam and Eve. His main strategy from the very beginning is to try to get us to not talk to God. Think about what he did with Adam and Eve. And he tries to do the very same thing with us. Oh, you don't need to pray is what he kind of whispers to us, or the thoughts he plants in our mind. Oh, you don't need to call on God. You know, you know what you're doing. You're degreed. You're capable. You've got experience. You're clever enough to figure this out. You know, part of the reason that David was a man after God's own heart was because David's whole posture and instinct was to call on the Lord at every moment. In Psalm 4 and 3, he says, Know that the Lord has set apart His faithful servant for Himself. The Lord hears when I call to Him. David says, I know that God hears me when I call. David writes this psalm while he's preparing for battle with the Philistines. And what he's in essence saying is, it really doesn't matter how big their, their army is. I know that when I pray, God's going to hear me. You know, prayer is so significant. It's something that God desires from us so much that He even says that people who don't pray are wicked. Absolutely. It's in the Scriptures. In Psalm 14 and verse 4, watch this. It says, Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. So who is... God talking about evildoers. How does he define them? People who don't call on the Lord. See, family, what God wants more than anything else is he wants our attention. He wants our focus to be on him. And that's what prayer does. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 50 and verse 15. 
God says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Watch this. And you will honor me. God says, we honor him when we pray, when we cry out to him, when we implore aid from him. Here's the second thing that I'll give you as we study this passage a little bit more. Prayer is what we should depend on and what we should commit to. So I pray that you have reordered your life during these 21 days of prayer and fasting. Or maybe you've begun to reorder your life in these 24 hours of of prayer. We've got several hours to go. But I want to encourage you to understand that prayer is what we should depend on and commit to. How do I commit to it? How do I depend on it? Number one, set an appointment. Do you have a daily appointment with God? In the earlier segment, I shared about my daily appointments, 5 a.m. every day. Why is that important? Because often we are so busy that we don't make time for God. And if you want to have a powerful prayer time with God, it starts by setting a schedule. Okay? We arrange our schedule around that which is the most important to us. So when you set that appointment, here's the next thing. Be still in worship. The way you begin that appointment is be still before the Lord and just begin to worship Him. God, I just want to thank you for giving me this moment to just be with you. Being still is an important act of worship. And you know what? It's kind of hard for so many people because we live in a day with so many distractions. Psalm 46 and 10, God says, Be still and know that I am the Lord. We are so quick to keep moving, but one of the most powerful times you can have with God is just to be still. Here's the third thing you ought to do is begin to pray and read. After worship, what happens is you're being still and you are posturing your heart to really hear from the Lord. That's when you begin to pray and read. That's when you get into the Word and begin to make your supplications known unto the Lord. We actually have on our website a reading plan. I talk a lot about it every day. We spend time in the Word of God, and as a faith community, we are reading through the Scriptures together. So if you want more information about our reading plan, go out to uh, the worship center, cc.org or twccc.org, and you can find that information. We also have that information out on our app. But then fourthly, listen and write, because here's what's going to happen. When you get into those scriptures and you're reading, Holy Spirit's going to grab your heart. One of those chapters, one of those verses is really going to speak to you, and it's going to stand out, and you're going to know it. And that's why you want to listen and write because you want to write down that that verse of those verses that really grab your heart because that's God's word for you for that day. This is a part of our SOAP devotional method. SOAP is an acronym that stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. You read the scriptures and then the one that grabs your heart, you're going to say, okay, let me start writing that in my journal. You write what you observe happening, you write the application, and then you write out your prayer. When you do that, you will find that you will have a powerful, powerful time with God and you will recognize how prayer is not just powerful, but it's something that should be the hallmark of your life that you depend on. Father God, eternal source of light, in the unity of our family, we turn our hearts toward you, seeking your guidance and blessing for our spiritual journey. You are the wellspring of wisdom and faith as we humbly ask for your presence to nurture our spiritual growth and deepen our faith. Grant us the desire to seek you earnestly, to hunger and thirst for a deeper connection with you. May our hearts be open to receive the lessons and insights you have prepared for us on this journey of faith. Guide us toward opportunities to learn and grow together as a family. May our discussions be filled with meaningful reflections, and may we inspire one another through our individual experiences and discoveries. Bless us with discernment to recognize your presence in our lives, whether in moments of joy or challenges. Help us to turn to you in prayer and contemplation, finding solace and strength in your unwavering love. 
May our spiritual growth be reflected in our actions as we strive to live out the values of compassion, kindness, and forgiveness. Let our faith not remain confined to words, but be a living testimony of your grace in our lives. Strengthen the bonds of our family through our shared spiritual journey. May our faith be a source of unity as we encourage one another to draw closer to you and to walk in your ways. In your infinite wisdom, lead us deeper into the mysteries of your love. May our spiritual growth be a continuous process, a journey of transformation that shapes our hearts and souls according to your divine plan. With gratitude and hope, we offer this prayer, knowing that you are the ultimate guide on our spiritual path. In your holy name, we seek your blessing for spiritual growth and a deepening of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Passionate healer, we come before you as a family. Recognizing the pain of emotional wounds and conflicts that have touched our lives, we humbly seek your divine touch to bring healing and reconciliation to our hearts and to guide us towards the power of forgiveness and letting go. We acknowledge that emotional wounds can linger and fester, causing pain that affects our relationships and well being. Grant us the strength to face these wounds with courage and help us to release the burdens that they bring. Infuse our hearts with the power of forgiveness that we may let go of grudges and hurt feelings. Help us to extend grace to one another just as you have extended grace to us. May the chains of resentment be broken replaced with a spirit of understanding and compassion. Heal the scars of past conflicts, replacing them with a renewed sense of unity and love. May we be agents of healing, offering apologies and seeking reconciliation where needed. Guide us to communicate openly and honestly so that misunderstandings may be cleared and relationships restored. May our conversations be marked by empathy and may we listen with the intention of understanding rather than judgment. Teach us to nurture a culture of kindness and empathy within our family where love and forgiveness are valued above all else. Help us to remember that we are bound together by bonds of care and support and that our collective healing contributes to the well-being of each individual. In your mercy, grant us emotional healing and the strength to let go of grievances. We place our wounded hearts in your loving hands, believing that you are the ultimate source of healing and restoration. In your holy name, we pray for the power of forgiveness and healing. Amen. God, gracious guardian, we gather before you as a family, seeking your divine protection and safety. In a world that can often be unpredictable, we entrust our well-being into your loving hands, knowing that you are our ultimate shield and refuge. Surround each family member with your watchful presence, shielding them from harm and danger. Safeguard their physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being and guide them away from paths that may lead to harm. Grant us safety in our daily activities and travels. Whether we are at home, at work, or on a journey, may your angels watch over us, ensuring our safe passage through every endeavor. Be with us as we navigate the challenges of life, providing wisdom and discernment to make choices that lead to safety. In times of uncertainty, grant us the peace that surpasses all understanding. Help us to trust in your providence, knowing that you are in control even when circumstances seem overwhelming. Empower us to be vigilant and responsible in our actions, taking necessary precautions to prevent harm. But even as we take practical steps, 
May we never lose sight of the fact that our ultimate security rests in your care. Lord, as we go about our lives, may your protective presence be our constant champion. May your light guide us through the darkest of times and lead us to places of safety and refuge. With gratitude and faith, we offer this prayer placing our trust in your unfailing protection. In your holy name, we seek your blessings for safety and security. Amen. Heavenly Father, I come before you today with a heart filled with gratitude for the season of singleness in which I find myself. Lord, I pray for contentment and joy in this phase of my life, knowing that true happiness comes from a relationship with you rather than a romantic partner. You are the source of all joy and contentment, and I acknowledge that my ultimate fulfillment can be found in you alone. Help me to fully embrace this season of singleness as an opportunity to draw closer to you, to discover my purpose, and to find joy in your presence. In moments of loneliness or longing, remind me of your unfailing love and companionship. Fill the voids in my heart with your peace and contentment. Help me to focus on the many blessings and opportunities that singleness affords, rather than dwelling on what I lack. Lord, may I use this time to grow in my faith and become the person you have created me to be. Grant me the wisdom to seek you first in all things, trusting that as I delight in you, you will fulfill the desires of my heart in your perfect timing. Teach me to find joy in serving others, in pursuing my passions, and in building meaningful relationships with friends and family. Let my life be a testament to the abundant joy that comes from living in alignment with your will. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of singleness. I trust in your plan for my life and know that you are preparing me for whatever lies ahead. May my contentment and joy you shine brightly and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, I humbly come before you seeking your divine guidance and wisdom in discovering and pursuing my life's purpose and direction. You are the author of my life and I trust in your plan for me. Please grant me clarity, discernment, and the courage to follow the path you have laid out for me. Lord, I pray for your guidance in my career. Help me to discern the work that aligns with my skills, passions, and values. May I find fulfillment and purpose in my daily job, knowing that it is a way to honor and serve. Guide me in my hobbies and interests, Lord. Show me how to use my talents and hobbies in ways that bring joy to my life and positively impact others. Let my pursuits be a source of growth and inspiration. I also seek your direction in personal growth. Grant me the strength to overcome obstacles and the wisdom to make choices that align with your will. Help me to continually learn and develop both spiritually and personally. Lord, I surrender my desires and plans to you. May your will be done in my life, even when it may differ from my own aspirations. Give me the patience to wait on your perfect timing and the faith to trust that your plan is always better than my own. In moments of uncertainty, remind me of your promise in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Thank you, Lord, for your guidance and loving care. I trust that as I seek your direction, you will reveal my life's purpose and grant me the wisdom and courage to pursue it wholeheartedly. May my life bring glory to your name. In 
Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Spirit of the living God, we thank you and we praise you for being all-knowing and all-sufficient God. We come before you with a thankful heart, a praise on our lips and an open heart. Today is the day that you have afforded us and we truly thank you and want to glorify your holy name. Lord, we ask that you transform our minds, that we may gain mental health and wellness in this very moment. Lord, you did it for me, and I know that you can do it again for someone else. You are a faithful Lord, and you have the ability to heal all manner of anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders, depression, eating disorders, dementia, schizophrenia, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Lord, we trust in your abilities to heal our psyche however you want. Lord, give us the wisdom to seek counseling, to take the necessary medication or obtain whatever treatment we may need to become mentally well and healthy in your name, Jesus. Your word says that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of a power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, we need a sound mind to have a sufficient mental capacity to understand our actions and the actions of others. We surrender our human limitations to you, Lord, so we can get mentally well because we cannot do it without your power and your guidance. Lord, we love you and we praise you, great and loving Father. We know that you are answering because we are your children and we can ask anything and you will provide for us. You are faithful and we will give you the glory in advance for the mental healing that is happening even now. In Jesus' name, amen. God, I believe you have imparted your life into me. Your life restores my body with every breath I breathe and every word I speak. I believe every part of my body functions the way you created it to. I believe my immune system will grow stronger every day. I believe my bones, muscles, and ligaments are aligned and in perfect condition. I believe my organs are healthy and full of vitality. I believe the Holy Spirit dwells in me and quickens my immune system with life and wisdom of God, which guards the life and health of my body. I believe the power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me, permeating his life through my veins, sending healing throughout my entire body. I believe my body is the template of the Holy Spirit. I command my body to release harmful toxins. I believe my body is in perfect chemical balance. I believe Jesus Christ bore my sickness and carried my pain. Therefore, I give no place to illness and discomfort. For God sent his word and I am healed. I believe by faith in the name of Jesus, I am made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed me. I believe that in Christ's timing and his will, I will be healed, raised with him, and experience everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen.